Welcome back. Good to be back with you all again uh, today. And I'm going to talk, I think I have uh, about an hour for this presentation on RCTs. That's what I planned for. So. <laughs> uh, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, so, you know, uh, just like we talked about yesterday, um, you know, you, you often want to study the impact of a program um, on an outcome that aims uh, uh, to improve, you know, um, that the program intends to improve. So um, just as an example, we might be interested in the effect of taking uh, CTE courses on high school graduation rates or rates of post-secondary enrollment. Um, so for individuals who participate in the program, uh, we can observe their outcomes, uh, like whether they graduated from high school or enrolled in, in post-secondary education after they participate. Uh, but to know how the programs affected their outcomes, we need to know what their outcomes would have been had they not participated. So again, that's the counterfactual that we talked about yes, yesterday that we can never observe in practice. Uh, and then the advantage of an RCT is that it allows us to estimate the counterfactual based on the outcomes of non-participants um, in, in a clear way. So in a well-designed and well-executed RCT, comparing the outcomes of program participants to the outcomes of non-participants actually tells you the impact of the program. Uh, because of the strong internal validity of a well-executed uh, RCT, the design is sometimes called the gold standard of impact evaluation. Um, and, you know, RCTs offer the best evidence on program impacts. So, um, in a basic randomized control trial, uh, the units of analysis and observation um, that are part of the analytic sample are assigned to one of two groups, uh, treatment or control. Uh, participants assigned to the treatment group are eligible to receive the intervention being studied. Those assigned to the control group are not. Uh, importantly, the assignment of individuals to experimental conditions must be solely by chance. So such as flipping a coin and assigning units to the treatment group if the coin comes up heads and to the control group if it comes up tails. Uh, uh, for example, in one study, um, Hemmelt uh, from 2019 from North, University of North Carolina, Rising uh, ninth graders uh, were interested in attending an information technology focused career academy. Uh, those students were randomly selected from among the pool of interested students who applied. Uh, an experimental design could have more than two experimental conditions. Um, if multiple components to the program are being studied, uh, a multi arm design can allow the researcher to estimate the separate impacts of uh, program components. Uh, but you have to make sure that you're sufficiently powered to detect differences between those those arms or reasonable differences. Um, the probability of assignment to the experimental conditions doesn't have to be the same for each condition. Um, so rather than a 50-50 chance of being assigned to the treatment group and a two-arm RCT, you can use a higher or lower proportion um, of eligible units assigned to the treatment group. So the analytic sample is a set of observations used to estimate the impact of an intervention being studied in an RCT, but should include only those individuals who are randomly assigned to one of the two experimental conditions, so the treatment uh, and con or control groups. For example, if applicants to a program are screened before being randomly assigned to the experimental conditions, with only those being between 18 and 24 years old eligible for the program, then the analysis sample should not include applicants uh, whose ages were outside of that range. That makes sense. Um, so the um, RCTs are really challenging uh, to implement successfully. Um, for example, a lot of times program administrators don't want to deny services to their clients um, and resist using a lottery to determine uh, who gets services and who does not uh, for very good reasons in uh, most cases, many cases. Um, it's also challenging integrating random assignment into program operations can be uh, difficult and may require close collaboration uh, with administrators to ensure that the randomization is done correctly. Um, you know, RCTs are 
costly. Um, so that's a, a challenge. Uh, and they're also, you know, it can take a good while uh, with a lot of RCTs to observe the outcomes you're interested in and to really look at impacts. So that's another, uh, you know, limitation. If you need results uh, now to make program improvements, uh, oftentimes an RCT, unless it's using retrospective lottery data uh, or something like that, can be um, a limitation. Um, when, when assigning individuals, RCTs are best suited for situations in which a program has excess demand. Uh, so in that scenario, using a lottery to allocate limited program spots appeals uh, to a sense of fairness and is often why a lot of uh, school districts or programs utilize a lottery process in the first place. Um, program administrators also may be more open to implementing an RCT if the probability of assignment uh, to treatment is greater than 50%. Um, I've seen that happen in, in practice uh, with partners and, and various uh, studies uh, where we set the uh, treatment probability um, higher because they wanted to get more uh, students to receive the services under study. The, pro the, the issue with that is, and downside of that, is that it uh, reduces your statistical power um, for your design. So when you do that, you have to have more students in the sample to compensate for that. Um, so levels of randomization. When, when designing an RCT, uh, you have to decide the level at which the randomization is going to be implemented. Um, you can do individual level random assignment that involves randomization at the level of an individual program participant. Uh, for example, students interested in a school program providing work-based learning programs could be randomly assigned either to participate uh, in the program or not. Uh, cluster random assignment is a little bit different. It involves randomizing not at the level of individual participants, but for groups of individuals that we call clusters. So sometimes it's not feasible to randomize at the individual level. Uh, for example, to study the effects of a new school level CTE strategy on student outcomes, you might randomize schools in a district to implement the new strategy or not. Um, and the outcome of interest may still be the individual level outcomes like student test scores. So you're randomizing at a higher level uh, at, at the cluster than, than you are at, um, interested in outcomes. Estimating um, program impacts using an RCT is similar um, for both individual and cluster designs, but when using a cluster design, you have to account for clustering at the analysis stage. Um, so to operationalize random assignment in practice, um, one simple approach would be to randomize each participant as they enter the study. Uh, for example, as students are determined eligible to participate in the study, you could flip a coin and determine um, their exper experimental assignment. And the problem with this approach is that there's a risk that the treatment and control group could end up unbalanced simply by chance. Uh, for example, if you expect the analytic sample to be composed mostly of males, uh, the small proportion of females in the sample could end up being assigned mostly to the treatment or control group. This happens uh, often in, in studies. Uh, so if the two groups are severely unbalanced by gender, uh, you may question whether the estimated treatment in fact, in effects are biased by that imbalance. Um, so to address this, we use oftentimes a, a stratified random assignment or a blocking strategy uh, to help ensure that the treatment and control groups are balanced. So this is a common approach. Um, in this case, uh, the samples were split into groups on the basis of one or more characteristics like gender in the previous example. Uh, within, each groups, within each group, units are randomly assigned. So the treatment assignment probability can vary by group. Uh, for example, you might split the sample into two groups by baseline uh, math scores and assign 50% of the students with high baseline math uh, scores to the treatment and 75% um, uh, with uh, low baseline math scores to the control group. If you, if you use a blocking uh, procedure when randomizing, then you need to control for blocks later when estimating treatment effects. So with that uh, kind of gone over a lot, I want to see if there's any questions or comments.
Trent, you see you have um, a question in the chat box. I could you read it to me? That's what we did yesterday with uh, Cassie. It was a little bit easier. Oh sure. I was asking um, is pairwise random assignment where you would rank your analytic sample on some indicator and then randomly assign to one within each pair. Is that considered a blocking strategy? Um, it's similar in nature to a blocking strategy. Um, I don't, I, I'd have to, I have to think about, I have to think about that and get back with you <laughs> to answer that specifically. But it, it's uh, the, the, um, the reason for, for doing it is similar to why you'd want to do a blocking strategy. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So statistical power. Um, this is a challenge with RCTs uh, because you got to have enough uh, students or observations in your sample uh, to actually uh, test test the effect. So when designing an RCT, you want to make sure that the study has a good chance of detecting an impact if one exists. Uh, the way to judge whether that's the case is to analyze the power of your experiment. Uh, the statistical power associated with the research design indicates how likely it is that the analysis will detect an impact if the intervention truly has one. At the study design stage, power calculations identify the sample size necessary to give the design sufficient power. And such calculations avoid situations where an RCT finds no effect, uh, but is based on a sufficiently small sample that is unclear whether the intervention truly has no impact uh, or the sample was just too small uh, to detect it. It also helps ensure that the sample size is no bigger than necessary so you can make more efficient uses, use of resources. Power calculations are based on four inter interrelated factors, the sample size, the size of the impact that you expect to be estimating, um, significance level, and power. Uh, if you know any three, you can solve uh, for the fourth. Um, generally, for a given significance level and hypothesized impact, larger sample sizes uh, provide greater power. Um, they make it possible to detect even smaller true impacts. Uh, the appropriate formulas for calculating power depend not only on the factor uh, factors presented earlier, but also a statistical method um, used to estimate impacts, such as comparing means versus uh, including covariates. Um, so for example, using standard assumptions for an outcome like graduation uh, rate of 85%, with a sample of 100, you can only detect an impact as small as 15 percentage points. Uh, so your experiment is only likely to find an impact if the true impact is to increase the graduation rate all the way up to 100%. Um, you need a larger sample. <laughs> uh, with a sample of 1,000, you can detect an impact as small as six percentage points. Now your experiment is likely to find an impact uh, if the true impact is at least six percentage points, which is a more reasonable expectation. So when thinking about designing studies, you really have to think about, um, and it, wherever possible, draw on past data and research on the intervention or similar interventions that you're trying to uh, or, or you're interested in studying and think about what is your best estimate based on all the evidence you have about what the size of the impact is likely to be and power your uh, study um, to at least you know show uh, reasonable uh, effect, effect sizes of that magnitude um, so there's an art to thinking about what, uh, and in a purposeful way, uh, research-driven way, thinking about what the likely effect size is, is um, likely to be. Um, most statistical computing software packages have commands that uh, allow you to do power analyses uh, very easily. Uh, Stata has a power command, uh, and R has a PWR package. Um, that you can use. I actually haven't used either of those. Um, I um, have a, a spreadsheet program that I use and I've used for a long time. Um,
So assessing baseline equivalence, um, if random assignment was executed well, the baseline characteristics of treatment and control groups should be balanced. And to confirm that the random assignment produced balanced treatment and control groups, you can test for statistically significant differences between uh, characteristics that were measured at baseline. Um, so that is before the treatment was offered. Um, most often these data will come from a baseline survey that you collected uh, or existing administrative data covering uh, the pre-intervention period. If random assignment was successful, there should be no or few statistically significant differences and baseline characteristics between the treatment and comparison groups. Of course, they happen at random sometimes as we uh, uh, talked about, so it can be um, a, a limitation uh, or you stratify from the beginning to ensure or reduce the chance of that happening. So uh, potential threats uh, to um, internal validity, validity with uh, RCTs, um, attrition and missing data. Although we'll not spend time discussing them in detail, two other issues, um, attrition and missing data, um, neither is specific to the RCT design per se. Attrition refers to outcome data being unavailable for some sample members. Uh, which can bias the estimated treatment effects. For example, if the outcome is derived from a follow-up survey, some study participants may fail to complete the survey. There's two types of attrition that, that matter. Overall attrition, so for example, 50% of participants return actually return the follow-up survey, and differential attrition uh, between treatment and comparison groups. Both can bias the estimated treatment effect. The really problematic, the one that's particularly problematic is differential attrition uh, because um, you're um, getting, uh, the, the idea is that the treatment might have affected whether uh, students or participants um, answered survey questions and uh, may have different uh, baseline outcomes or baseline data. Um, missing data arise when some data are missing for some study participants. Uh, for example, a study participant may have declined to answer one question on a follow-up survey. Missing data can be dealt with in a various number of ways, such as dropping observations uh, with incomplete data or imputing uh, missing data. So I See if there were any questions that came up uh, through all that. Yeah, I, I, had a quick, I had a quick question. What if you're, you say you do everything right and you're in your random assignment, and like you said, you, maybe you do find differences in the baseline equivalence. Is the strategy just to scrap it and like reassign people, or what do you generally do? So that is what, uh, there. there is a technique that, uh, people use, and there's a whole literature on whether it's <laughs> appropriate or not, uh, but uh, I've used it in some uh, studies in the past um, called re-randomization, uh, where you explicitly do what you're talking about. You set parameters um, from the beginning about what you're willing to accept in terms of differences in um, characteristics between, uh, baseline character characteristics between treatment and control, and then you go through random assignment procedures until you get a sample where treatment and control uh, meet those parameters. Um, there's pros and cons that I, I can't really get into, but <laughs> um, it, it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it is one strategy that, that people use. Um, you know, the, the other thing, uh, you know, a lot of people will just note it as a limitation when they, uh, you know, analyze the data and think through like what the implications of having, you know, a larger share of uh, male students than you would expect in the, in the treatment group might have and what that means. Um, so, were there other questions? A question on attrition. Um, uh, are there sort of commonly accepted thresholds for att attrition? Like, um, 
thinking initially in terms of overall attrition, but is there a point where you just say, this is way too much for this to be useful? I, re I mean, recognize like you'd think about like sort of power analysis and what size and effect could you actually detect, but like let's say 75% overall didn't return the follow-up survey. Does that raise red flags? Um, yeah. yeah. Is it, yeah. So, so I believe um, what works clearinghouse has um, some standards that they use um, that I'd have to get back to you about what explicitly um, they are. But um, I, I think there are some like general uh, parameters that people often use. So um, yeah. I can, yeah, I can look in there. That's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So estimating uh, treatment effects. Um, so the difference in, in the differences in means between treatment and comparison groups gives an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect from an RCP. Um, researchers often supplement uh, the comparison of means with regression adjusted estimates. You don't really need to do this from a validity standpoint. This is uh, because it's an unbiased estimate without controlling for these differences. Um, what you're really doing is increasing the precision um, when uh, the outcome is correlated with any of the observable uh, baseline characteristics. So um, that's the reason for including covariates and in, in your um, when you're estimating effects from RCTs. Um, so to use the regression adjusted estimate uh, adjustment to estimate the treatment effect, you estimate the regression model is shown. Um, uh, wait. here. <laughs> I was a little ahead of myself. Um, so in the, in the regression equation, the term XI represents the set of baseline characteristics uh, for which you want to control. And um, TI is an indicator variable equal to one for observations um, that were assigned to the treatment group. And the treatment effect is represented by the parameter um, delta. Uh, so Standard uh, statistical hypothesis testing will show whether the estimated treatment effect is statistically significant. Right. Um, so to this point, uh, we've been implicitly assuming that individuals assigned to treatment actually receive treatment, uh, and those assigned to control uh, don't. And that often more, nearly never happens in practice uh, fully. Um, so um, the process may turn out to be a lot more complex. Um, some treatment group members may choose not to enroll in the program being studied um, despite the offer. Uh, some control group members may somehow enroll in the program or else receive the same services from elsewhere. So there's examples of, uh, these are examples of non-compliance with uh, treatment assignment, as we call it. So I don't, we won't go into detail here, but there are common ways of estimating uh, treatment effects when some degree of non-compliance is present. Um, one way uh, that you can just do is to estimate the treatment effect uh, described earlier using either difference in mean or regression adjustment, ignoring whether the treatment was actually received by each participant. And we call this estimate the intent to treat effect. It's the effect of being randomly assigned to receive a treatment, uh, which is often very relevant uh, parameter, um, particularly in policy contexts. So where you're thinking about uh, the impact of, uh, you know, uh, financial aid or something like that. It's the impact of offering the aid, right? Um, Using uh, some assumptions about the nature of non-compliance, you can also estimate uh, what's called the complier average causal effect, which is the average effect of treatment on those individuals who would comply with their treat, uh, treatment assignment. Um, so there's two ways to recover the complier average causal effect. Um, 
kind of the simple way. And, and for those who are economists um, by, by training or think like that, uh, this is what in economics we call a local average treatment effect. It's basically um, using uh, the random assignment as an instrument for whether or not you um, participate in the treatment. Um, whether you're actually treated. Uh, but the simpler way is to divide um, the estimated ITT, intent to treat effect, by the difference in the proportion of individuals that actually receive the uh, treatment between those assigned to treatment and control groups. So it's scaling up the ITT effect by the basically the effect that being assigned to treatment had on your treatment status, whether you actually receive the treatment. So if you well, if it if tr being treated, uh, being assigned to treatment increased the probability that you receive treatment by a third, you'd scale up the um, ITT by three, uh, by a factor of three to account for it only affecting a, a, a third of people, right? Participants. Does that does that make sense? And then again, the alternative is to use the IV approach. The, um, the the random assignment uh, is a valid instrument for your treatment status because um, it's random and it affects the probability that you receive treatment. Uh, but then it's, it's a local average treatment effect and then it's the um, treatment effect for those who are affected by uh, getting ra the random assignment, if that makes sense. Oh, and here's the, I got ahead of myself with the <laughs> IV, but um, this is using the IV approach. Um, so um, the, uh, you, you basically regress, um, it's, it's, you use the random assignment as the instrument for whether or not you're actually treated. Let me see, knowledge check, <laughs> uh, questions or thoughts. Can, can you just repeat the, um, the local average treatment effect? Uh, you're scaling up by what? Uh, you're scaling up by basically the effect that your treatment status, uh, being being randomly assignment, assigned to treatment, um, the effect of that on whether or not you actually receive treatment. So if um, only if receiving treatment uh, or being as assigned to treatment randomly uh, increases your uh, probability of actually receiving treatment by half, uh, so you're 50% more likely than you would have been under control, mm -hmm. um, then you need to scale it up by a factor of two because um, half of those uh, people in the treatment group are actually not treated, right? Got it. Uh, yeah, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let me see what time it is real quick. We have about 30 minutes. So um, what works clearing house standards for RCTs? Um, again, RCTs are the gold standard. Uh, what people always say for estimating program effects, because when implemented well, uh, design, the design ensures that differences in outcomes can be attributed to the treatment being studied and not to other factors. Uh, to achieve this promise, RCT designs must be well executed. The What Works Clearinghouse has two criteria for well executed randomization. The study must assign units entirely by chance. And every unit in the analysis must have a chance of being assigned to each group. So because of these criteria, an analytic sample that includes participants who are assigned 
either group by researchers or field workers, including those who joined after the randomization process, uh, will not be reviewed as RCT. So um, if, so say um, you have, you're randomizing, you're randomizing um, schools to receive uh, some inter, you know, CTE intervention. And um, you measure baseline characteristics of students in the school. And then after you implement the RCT, you have a lot of students drop and join the school, right? Um, and then that's going to be a, a, a challenge with the RCT. So in terms of estimating uh, the, the effect. So there's, there's, problem, there's issues there. Um, so for studies that are not uh, randomized at the cluster level, the study must have sufficiently low attrition rate to be eligible for the highest standard uh, rating meets what works clearinghouse without reservations. Um, two types of attrition th thresholds are used by what works uh, clearinghouse reviewers. So this is where, what I was getting at uh, earlier. Um, the optimistic attrition threshold and the cautious attrition threshold. So the optimistic threshold is used for studies with interventions that are unlikely to affect attrition. Uh, for example, a beginning level reading intervention uh, study may use the optimistic threshold because it's unlikely uh, that a reading intervention would affect the probability that students leave the study. Uh, so in middle school, you're, you're unlikely to leave school because of a inter reading intervention. But um, the cautious attrition threshold uh, is used uh, when participation or exclusion in the intervention is actually really likely to affect attrition. So um, like a secondary math mathematics intervention may use a cautious attrition threshold because high school students can choose to leave a class or select a different class because of the intervention. Um, so. You know, a lot of the lottery-based assignment studies would, um, for C CTE interventions, would likely need to use the um, the, the cautious attrition, attrition threshold because students may decide to leave the CTE program because of what they were assigned to, right? Oops. So um, a cluster level RCT uh, must have a low cluster level attrition. Uh, limit the risk of bias because of joiners. These are the students who are, or participants, observations or individuals who um, join after random assignment or leave after random assignment. Um, and have low individual level non-response uh, to be eligible uh, to meet what works clearinghouse without reservations. Studies that don't meet the requirements for the highest what works clearinghouse standard rating may be eligible uh, for standards with reservations, such as an individual RCT, individual level RCT that did not pass the attrition threshold, but that demonstrates baseline equivalence of the analytic intervention and comparison groups. Um, or a cluster RCT for which any of the three requirements that we talked about above are not met, but for which baseline equivalence actually is established. Um, moreover, uh, individuals in the analytic sample must be representative of clusters, uh, and the study must be uh, must either feature low cluster level attrition or demonstrate um, baseline equivalence of the analytic sample of clusters. And studies that don't satisfy the more lenient standards will receive um, does not meet what we're declaring house design standards. So um, there's a large, uh, a, a complex process for determining uh, the uh, what we're declaring house uh, standards. I, I looked at the uh, procedures uh, 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 last night and a week ago, and it, it's involved in <laughs> uh, rigorous. So um, I'd encourage you to look at those uh, 
standards in the, in the process if you are interested in it uh, for more details on that. Um, any questions? I think that's what I had for today or thoughts.